Oh no, it's still off my record. So, uh, can you all shout out quickly, as quickly as you can, all the different uh, uh, attributes uh, for millennials? Title. Precious. Short attention span. Short attention span. Entitled. Entitled. I've given you some help here. Precious. Looking for shiny objects, self-interested, narcissistic, unfocused, don't like grunt work. Disengaged, work has to be fun, low self-esteem. Promotion every three months. <laughs> Participation trophies. Participation trophies, looking for shiny objects, lack of interpersonal skills, they're lazy. Simon Sinek, uh, Mark had sent me a thing on Simon Sinek, he's like the darling of uh, the TED Talk circuit, and he's not really hot on them. Thinks that their parents are putting strings to get them to good colleges and get good <laughs> grades that everyone wants a trophy, they're slaves to technology, Mark spoke about that, and they're impatient, they're always looking for instant gratification. So let's talk about it, what's a millennial? So I did an extensive amount of research last night on the internet, <laughs> and I found out that uh, it's people aged between 39 and 19. It's a pretty big gap to start generalizing a generation, but it's the internet, and the internet doesn't lie. So, wow. But basically, you have to write off 35% of the US workforce. Like, I mean, how can you start a business if you have to hire these people? I've got three children, they're all millennials, and I wanna get a refund. Don't want them anymore. <laughs> they're useless. So, about, Six years ago, my best friend uh, and myself started a business with uh, these two young guys. I was in my late 40s, my partner a uh, little bit part, oh, younger than me, but the same, and our partners were 25 and 23 years old. Absolute geniuses. And uh, since then, we started just the four of us, and Jason, who's like a, he was a millennial at the time, joined us, and since then, uh, in about five years, we've grown, we're about 150 people now, and uh, by the end of the year, we should be about 200 people. We haven't taken any funding, it's all just been on just sweat and tears, and a little bit of muscle and a bit of a hammer. And so, our average workforce is about 26 years old, and so we're probably doomed. You've got 40 years old, 20 year olds as partners, and then our average uh, workforce is 26 years old, so how could you possibly make a go of a business with this generation of energy vampires? And so, my perspective on millennials is a little bit different. I think they're curious. They're well educated. I think they have great work ethic. They've got great empathy. They're leaders. They're team players. They're dynamic. They're diverse. They're well-rounded, they all grew up playing the cello and they had to do soccer and they had to do the play and they had to do all the things. They're very well-rounded people. They're visionaries, they're philanthropic, they want to belong, they're agile, and they want to believe in something that's bigger than themselves. So what they're not, they're not naive, they're not gullible, they're not patient and they're not blind followers. And actions speak louder than words for them. They want to be challenged. They want to feel like they're growing personally and professionally. They want to be impactful. They want to understand where your company is going. They want transparency. They want guidance. They want to be coached. They want to belong. They want a community. And they want to be part of something that stands for something. So, all you've got to give them is these things, purpose, development, coaching. You've got to engage with them. You've got to focus on their strengths, and you've got to get to know who they are as people. I know that Dallas is a good center, 
I know they're used to the sales. I know Christine grew up and went to, uh, from New York and she went to NYU. I know Chris loves baseball. He loves the Dodgers, even though they lost the World Series, <laughs> which he's been crying about. <laughs> I know Iona is a soccer player and loves soccer. I know a lot of Andrew because he was more than I wanted to hear, quite frankly. <laughs> gotta know who they are. And basically, you've got to create a community for them. You've got to give them constant communication and feedback, as we discussed. And you've got to give them a community. We live in a very fractured world. And people are coming out of college, they're moving to new cities. For the first time, they're moving out of home. And you've got to create something for them where they feel like they want to go to every day. It's not about the ping pong table and about the beer keg. It's about the community that they get to participate in. And so if all you do is that, you're going to be great. It's really not that easy. So my transformational opportunity to figure this all out came about a little bit differently. Um, because I had run a company and built a company, which I started in, uh, uh, I, I started in 1998 and sold in 2006. So most of the people that worked for us, and we were also about 100 plus people, were baby boomers. And so it was a culture-based business, but the motivations and the inputs we gave people were somewhat, a bit, were somewhat different. And then at the age of uh, 44 years old, I came out of retirement to play on an international level rugby team, which was insanity. Uh, and suddenly I was on a rugby team as a player with a team that the average age was 25 years old. One of the boys. And it was like going, it was, it was a crazy experience. Uh, boom boxes in the change room before a game, boom boxes at practice, they all spoke a different language. It was really a, a really interesting experience. And so you would assume with all the attributes of the millennials, how could we possibly succeed together? They didn't even know, they had never heard of Hootie and the Plowfish. That's how young they were. So all the inputs that uh, were used to motivate or activate me when I was a young player didn't apply. We were brought up with threats, fear, conformity, bureaucracy, lack of innovation, freedom to express. Growing up, it was very a coach-driven methodology to how you could succeed, both in business and both in sports. And what we found that was very mobilizing with this team was creating trust, coaching, not telling, allowing each of them to solve their problems versus being told what to do, and creating leadership everywhere instead of having top-down leadership, making everybody a leader and having everyone be able to decide on a given day how they were gonna succeed. What was universal on the team were the same things that we needed in the olden days. Dedication, drive, commitment, camaraderie, teamwork, sacrifice, universal concepts. So I realized then that millennials are remarkable. So all you need to do is you've got to create an environment that's giving them the right input, the guidance, the direction, and if you can figure out what that is, that can mobilize and get these people going, that's what you get. You capture lightning in a bottle. There's magic. So how do you capture it? Culture, culture, and culture. So I had read a book called Legacy. It's a book by James Kerr, and it's a book centered on the New Zealand all-black rugby team. Arguably the most successful sporting team in the history of all sports. 92% uh, win rate over 100 plus years. So you can't really argue about that. You have organizations that have their time. The Celtics, the Patriots, a lot of people are happy about that, that it's not the Patriots anymore. Uh, companies that have their moment in the sun, Sears, etc. 
but they're unable to have sustainable excellence. They're unable to sustain themselves over an ex extended period of time. And so it fascinated me to try and understand what is the DNA of this team. And it's all captured in this book. And so then as you read it, you realize it's not a book about a rugby team. It's a book about the 15 principles that the All Blacks have uh, systemized and culturalized over all these years to effectively hold all of their players and coaches accountable to these underlying 15 principles. And so I had used it with some sporting teams. When we followed them, we did great. When we didn't follow them, we did poorly. And so I showed it to the partners. I said, listen, it's just the four of us. We're starting this new company. We don't know what we're gonna do. We don't know where we're gonna go. But we gotta believe in something. This can't just be about building a technology product and figuring out how to sell it. We gotta stand for something. And we gotta hold ourselves accountable to it. And then we gotta hold everybody who comes into this company accountable to these principles. And each one of these principles are very, very, very simple to read exceptionally difficult to live. And they basically things like they have different terminology for it, but no one being too big to do the little things. In the All Blacks, when they finish the national test match, their top players, their captains, clean the changing rooms before they leave. They are showing servant leadership. They have something called a no dickhead rule. We put it up on the walls for a while till we grew past about 25 people. We said, oh, I don't know if we can do that. So we changed it to new, no egos. But it's self-explanatory. If you think about in your life, if you're trying to build a great organization, have a great team, have a great family, have a lot of great friends, if you don't follow that rule, it's very difficult to create resonance and to create alignment. And so we have a no egos rule. And that starts with me. Keeping a blue head, teachers being leaders, creating a learning environment, encourage people to go for the gap. We went for a gap. We saw an opportunity in the market and we went after it. Why would we tell our people not to do the same? With such a fast growing company, we're always encouraging people, look for the opportunity, look for the gap, take a chance, do something different, put your hand up. The minute that they start, they're a veteran. We don't have any time for them to start figuring out, you know, proving their oats. They've got all these great attributes who want to put them to work immediately. So it's actually an interesting concept. It goes to, neuro, it goes to actually uh, uh, neuropsychology. And there's a concept that your brain is broken up into two parts. One is your blue, which is your left, which is your logical side. And then you've got the red, which is the reactive side. It's the caveman, fight, flight, or freeze. And so the whole concept is if you can be aware of why you're reacting in a certain way, using the left side of your brain, keeping a blue head, when you're in times of pressure, when you're in times of, of where you're getting some um, opportunities to make bad decisions, by keeping a blue head, you center yourself, you recognize that the responses you're getting, anger, fear, jealousy, hatred, ambivalence, are being driven by your red brain, and you switch on your left brain, and you try and counter balance what's going on with your red, and you have the blue taking over. And that allows you to take a few deep breaths, and basically focus in on what is the challenge, I recognize why I'm responding in this certain way, and now I can go and come up with a game plan as to how I'm gonna address it. And that allows for people to make better decisions. When you make decisions and you get afraid, you start breathing, and when you stop breathing, the blood stops going to your brain, and your brain stops working. I wish I'd read this when my kids were younger. <laughs> Truly. And so we talk, each one of these is something that we are talking to people all the time about. We speak about it all the time. And I'll get into that in a few minutes. And then changing your game when you're at the top of your game. One of the biggest challenges with companies, whether it's Motorola, Sears, all of these companies that have had these precipitous falls, and it's covered 
in a concept by George Lamb called the growth curve. And it's a, I was going to cover it today, but I didn't think there was enough time. But we speak to all of our people about the growth curve, which is a study of organisms. And companies are organisms. They're living organisms. They have an inception. They go through a startup phase. They go into a formative stage, then a normative stage, and then they generally die. If you look at extinct species, companies, and there's certain attributes that start creeping into companies over time that if you don't absolutely stamp out, they're gonna cause that precipitous drop. And so we speak to all of our people. They're coming straight out of college. Many times they haven't been spoken to about things like the growth curve. We're asking them to read a book about a, a sport and a country that many don't even know about and about principles that many people weren't speaking to them about. And we're trying to show them that these are important concepts. It's part of being a good ancestor and paying it forward to them. And so we talk about the growth curve and the things that are going to impact the growth curve at a certain point in time is arrogance and complacency. Great organizations fail when those two elements creep in. And so it's always being real. Always understand that you're not doing as well as you think you are. You're not as good as you are. You're not as big as you are. Staying grounded. And we try and keep everybody grounded, but in a way that is still motivating for them to succeed. Asking why. A lot of times people come in and say, yeah, we need to do this job. Start doing the work. If they don't ask us why, we're going, how is it possible you're going to know if you made a mistake? And so we're constantly asking our people to ask why. And so we have a policy where if they go to a manager or a supervisor and they say they have, a, they have an idea, they have a challenge, and the supervisor then can't get to a meeting of the minds, they're required to take it to the next level. And if they can't solve it there, they're required to take it all the way until they come to me. They have to have the opportunity to keep pushing until they get resolution. And usually resolution happens before that. But if it doesn't, I don't want anyone in the company not feeling like they got heard or they got the right understanding of why what they suggested wasn't either the right thing or the right time. Because really those are the only two reasons not to follow something. We've got 150 people. If every one of those people has a great idea, we've got 150 great ideas. And so you have to create an organization that's encouraging and capturing it and actioning on it in a very efficient way. And we're trying to do that and we try to do it all the time. And training to win. I didn't train well enough for this because I'm still reading from the screen. Ideally, I'd be able to just go like this. I wouldn't have to look back. And so in concept, everything you're trying to do, you need to put the time, the effort. You get in on a call with a client. You get in on the call with a, 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 a client that's not happy with what we're doing. If you just go in and you don't practice, you don't prepare yourself, you're going to not have a good outcome. And that goes to all other elements of your life. You can't just say, I want to be faster, I want to be stronger, I want to be a better listener. You have to come up with an action plan. And so what we're trying to encourage all of our people is you can't just say, I want to do this thing. You've got to say, how are you going to do it? Definitely understanding what it is. And so we do things like 360 feedback amongst the senior leadership. But then we went and shared it with all of our people in the company. And that level of transparency is important because they say, you're not just telling us we got to do better. We're showing them that we recognize that we're not perfect. And we have to have action plans. And we're doing the things that we need to do to be better. And that's why it's reasonable that we're asking them to do it as well. Creating your rituals. A big part of why we're doing it and we want to do it is we want to be a good ancestor. If people come to us for three months or three years or 10 years, we want that time with us to be meaningful to them. If we look back at the attributes of what truly drives millennials, these are important things. But in the context of being good leaders, that's the greatest gift you can give somebody. Nobody ever taught them about these principles in school or in the other jobs. And so if we have an opportunity to teach people how to deal with pressure by keeping a blue head, or if we can teach them how to be a better leader, how to learn how to be a servant leader, how to pass the ball, how to be a good teacher, how to be somebody who's a good student, 
asking why. These are universal skills we give people that when they go out into the world, to their families, to their friends, to their sporting teams, to their theater groups, to their church communities, they can take all of these lessons with them. And that's the greatest gift you can give when you're running a business. What's in it for us? Motivated and exceptional people. That's what we get. And so that's our recipe. It's all over our walls. We've got a few of these like this. If we have all of this in the recipe basket, we're going to have a wonderful cake at the end. So this is something we're talking about all the time with them. So what are the things that we look for? It starts with recruiting. You can have the best principles in the world and you can create the best culture in the world, but if you bring the wrong people in to your community, you're going to fail. And so it's not just about having a great community and great principles and living them and modeling them. You've got to make sure that you bring the right people in. So the four primary things I know I look for, and I think it's pretty systematic throughout our companies, we look for those four primary things. Work ethic, integrity, curiosity, and resilience, which ties into emotional intelligence. Emotionally intelligent people are generally very resilient. And that's where this whole connection between EQ and how people succeed comes in. Because things don't always go well. You're not going to do your job great. You're not going to get the promotion. Your client's going to be upset with you. Your boss is going to be upset with you. And you're not always going to get along with the person that you're sitting next to. It's not what happens to you. It's how you deal with it. And we're trying to teach our people to do that. And if you don't filter that out early, some people are not necessarily coachable. Hire well. If you're starting a business, hire well. Not anyone gets to play for the All Blacks, and not anyone just gets to play for Feedonomics. So part of your culture needs to be specialness. We're going to put a lot into people. We're going to do everything we can to help people be successful. But you need to not take that for granted. It's a privilege. We feel privileged to have people with us, but they have to see the privilege. Big problem in corporate America is we need to have principles. I'm not saying that happened with Motorola, but they get a marketing team, they get a focus group, they put it on the wall, they say, these are our values, these are our principles. If you don't believe them, it's better not to do it at all. Because we spoke about it, this generation, and quite frankly, every generation sees through the bullshit. And if you, don't do what you, if you don't do what you say, it actually puts you in, in, a, in a bigger challenge. They'll call you out. They won't believe. People who don't believe won't follow. They'll come to work. They need a paycheck. But they aren't going to do what needs to be done to be excellent. So there's a concept that I read in a book. It's a great guy called Patrick Lencioni. Uh, if you see me afterwards, I can give you the name. He's written a bunch of really good books. Uh, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, Meeting by Death, just great little uh, fable books, but really speaking to challenges you'll find in a business. And he wrote a book called The Advantage. I highly recommend if you're running a business or an organization or doing anything, it's a great read. And he speaks about this thing called the pyramid of success. And it's a very interesting concept. Most of the time, people are always focus in on results. They say, we need sales, we need more sales. I need to have a better relationship with my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my partner. And they talk about the results, but they don't talk about the building blocks that you need to get the results. So then they'll say, well, we need more sales, and I'm going to hold you accountable to those sales because I need you to be committed. And everybody nods their head and says, yes, sir, I'll absolutely do it. But it all starts down here. It starts with trust. If it's not built on a foundation of trust, it's all just words. It's just words on a, bo on a board. And so that takes a tremendous amount of effort to build trust. When you're saying things like the 15 principles, these are what we live by, you've got to live by them. And if you can create that trust and people recognize that your intent, whether it's as a, uh, as a business owner or as a friend or as a coach, is truly to get the best for the person. Then you're able to have conflict, feedback, 
You can give people critical feedback without them having the filter of, oh, you don't like me, what's in it, what's the deal, you're looking at, you're moving me out, I'm not doing a good, what's going on? That's what's going on in their mind when they're getting feedback if you don't have trust. So trust allows you to get rid of the filters. Once you can get through conflict and you can give proper critical feedback, then you can get commitment because the person has taken on the feedback and they've taken ownership for it. And once somebody's committed, they can hold themselves accountable and you can hold them accountable as well. And then you'll get results. You'll get results, but it doesn't start there. Repetition, repetition, repetition. You can't just say it once and then stop. You've got new people coming in all the time. You've got to go through it all over again and again and again. So you've got to have the energy for it. You and all your leaders have got to have the energy to keep on saying the same thing over and over again. Because you can't just put it on the wall and make a speech and assume people are going to get it. And so the things that we do is everyone who comes to our company reads Legacy and they don't understand why. Say, so welcome to Phenomics, you've got to read a book about a rugby team. They don't get it. But after a while, they start working in the environment, and then the hope is that they're going to start having some synapses. Everyone who comes in the company speaks to me. Everyone. We used to interview everyone. Now it's not possible, but there's not a single person who works at our company who won't sit down with me or my partner Brian or both of us, and we were going to talk to them about all the stuff I just spoke to you about. And so you set the foundation. Oh, I guess this stuff is really important to these guys. We buy them in. We buy them in early. And we tell them, you don't know what the work is you've got to do, but this stuff, these 15 principles, you can start doing that today. So now they know, I better read the book. Then we fool them and we tell them they've got to read the book because I'm going to be doing a follow-up with them in six weeks. Then we have the follow-up in six weeks, and I pretty much talk about all this stuff. Growth curve, pyramid of success. And so we start repet repetitively in reinforcing these things. Other things we're doing is basically having peer group leadings. We're having the people on the, uh, uh, all the people who are normal, you know, regular employees are being asked to facilitate meetings to talk about these things. So it's about embedding it in your culture. You have to make it living and breathing, and then living it every day. At 150 people now, we've got to a place where we bring on a employee, a full-time person called a people empowerment manager, and their job is to ensure that all these things we say we're doing, we're actually doing. Because it gets risky. You get to a certain scale where you start missing it. You start missing that legacy meeting. You start missing the meeting when they just started at the company, and now what's happening is you've got a fractured workforce. You've got some people that were connected, and you've got some people, your newer people, start being less connected, and now your culture starts fraying. And so the only way to do this is by an absolute obsessive, obsessive compulsive desire to ensure that this perpetuates itself. And if you don't, you run the risk that your culture is going to start dissipating. And when your culture dissipates, you've got fragmented employees. One of the most important things we do is we address the elephant in the room. Very, very squarely. We head it straight up. The elephant in the room is, according to another statistic that I found on the internet, 43% of millennials say they're going to leave their company in two years. So we're doing all of this work to train them, to culturalize them, to give them the actual hard skills, and they're going to leave? And so we speak about it with them. We say, we know that you're going to get solicited by through LinkedIn, through other companies. We want you to talk to us about it. You don't have to go outside on your phone and try and figure out, you know, how am I going to take this call? How am I going to assess this opportunity? They're coming out of college. They should be looking for more opportunity. We want them to talk to us about it. We want to be part of the process. We want to know, what is the job? What does it entail? What is the opportunity? Are they going to do the types of things you need for your development? And if they find something that we can't find them, they should go. Because our job is to be great ancestors and let them leave their legacy with us. And so it's been very open about the discussion. Does it work all the time? 
Interestingly enough, as much as we tell people they should talk to us about it, we're betting about 50-50. There's still this ingrained sense like, you probably still don't, you probably really don't mean that, right? But if we know what they want, we can find different opportunity within the company. We're growing fast. The best people to hire are the people you got. So, are we doing all of this to build and sustain a culture that engages, encourages, motivates, and develops millennials? No. We're not doing it for that purpose. The reason we're doing it is to build a culture that nurtures, coaches, develops, encourages, and motivates everyone, all human beings. None of the desires that our people have Purpose, respect, transparency, self-actualization, belonging, sense of personal satisfaction, growth, are limited to people who are 19 to 39 years old. They're universal. They're universal needs and desires, and if you can tap into them and understand what motivates and drives people to succeed, you're gonna be able to capture 